All right, welcome to the podcast on today's show with Jake from Phil and Manila. Thanks for joining. I appreciate you coming on. We can talk about your Shark Tank experience and everything else, but before we do, for people who don't know, what does your company do? Yeah, thanks for having me, Dave. A huge fan, so it's an it's honor to be here. So Phil and Manila is a food company with products positioned around Filipino culture and cuisine. Mm-hmm. I started the company back in 2020 during the height of pandemic, and it was kind of inspired by an article I read that in some areas of the U.S., 20% of the healthcare workforce fighting on the front lines of COVID were Filipino. So it kind of like inspired me as a Filipino-American immigrant to learn more about our people. And it turns out, you know, we are a thing. At the time, the second largest Asian American group, the largest in 11 states, including uh, California. Sure, yeah. Yet there was almost zero representation in the U.S. And that was the impetus behind starting Philomena to add representation. The thing that always blows me away about, uh, I guess, the Filipino culture is like Joe Coy is a incredible oh. comedian, right? Yes. But there's a whole subset of America that has no idea he exists. But he'll sell out arenas. Like he's huge, right? Yeah. And so that's always the metric for me. It's like how can we, we live in like parallel worlds to some extent. And so when you first started thinking about getting into the food game, what products did you want to bring? You could, you know, there's so many things. Why this product? What was the first products you came to market with? Yeah, for sure. And just to add on to what you said, it's wild because, you know, we're such a huge swath of the population. It's huge. So when I talk to folks, you know, who are not Filipino, I mean, they always have at least one person who's a family member or friend yeah. or coworker who is Filipino. And that's how they come to the cuisine. But when we started the company, we decided on, okay, we want to add Filipino food representation. What's the product to do so? Because there's so many things you could do in Filipino cuisine. And then I just thought about the parties we used to have in our Filipino family every weekend. You would typically find the same dishes at every party. And they're like more like stew dishes. So I was like, let's bring kind of like cooking sauces based on those as a first product. But slowly after that, we discovered, you know, there are many other ways we can introduce Filipino flavors. So we did condiments and then eventually spreads like our ube into the market. And when did you launch the company officially? Uh, It was April of 2020. Okay. So COVID (laughs) hits. It was COVID, yeah. Did it work out for you? COVID was kind of the reason we started. So I had another company before that, which was an almond milk company. And that did not do well during COVID. Yeah, what happened with that company? What, what were you doing with the almond milk game? Just curious. Yeah, so, you know, that was a fresh almond milk company. I started a farmer's market. We grew it to Whole Foods and Walmart. Kraft was an investor. But since so much of revenue was tied to store traffic, once that went away uh, during the pandemic, we shut that down. Was it shelf stable or was it all natural? So it was refrigerated. Had, yeah. yeah. So, you know, frozen. we shut that down. But, you know, okay. if that didn't happen, the starting film miller would not have happened as well. I'm an investor in an almond milk company. It's called Good Milk. And they, they went nationwide with, with Blue Bottle. Yeah. And so what's interesting is Nestle acquired Blue Bottle. And so yes. Nestle's trying to trying to basically powderize everything. And so the idea oh. is like... The quality goes away. Well, yeah. that's, that's the game is like, can you thread that needle? And then during, yeah. I guess, the pandemic, she was trying to figure that out. And it turns out she did. Yeah. And it kept the the healthy option, whatever it may be. And so now she's got a powdered version, she being Brooke from the founder of Good Milk, and it's working. And so yeah. and so I think like sort of tangentially here, but the future of coffee shops is basically you walk in and it's just water, coffee beans, espresso machine, and that's it. And then everything yeah. else is powder format. And so you now you need significantly less space. So all the storage you needed for milks is right. now gone. And yeah. so now your footprint for a coffee shop is significantly less. And I think Nestle specifically via Blue Bottle is trying to do that. And obviously, if you can powderize it and it works, now you have a yeah. product. Really interesting. It's like a high-end K-cup. Kind of, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Bit. It's like yeah. a scoop, a scoop, a scoop. Yeah, <laughs> very interesting. Okay, cool. So you, but what did you learn during that process? Like, what was your big takeaway walking away from the almond milk company? Uh, well, you know, I came from CPG before that as a, as a corporate career. My big takeaway from that is that, you know, no matter how much you learn from corporate, being an entrepreneur is kind of like a punch in the face. I mean, you learn <laughs> something new every day, right? So it's very humbling. Yeah. You learn a lot every day. Um, but it kind of brought me, so when I started Philip Manila, it brought me back to kind of my roots, right? Starting off very gritty, very scrappily, and just trying to build like an MVP out of nothing. Because I started the company with my stimulus check. Just, I bought a couple things off Amazon to build the first prototypes. I love this I story, by the way. You told me this yesterday, and I was like, we're going to save that for the podcast. <laughs> okay, yeah. yeah. How big was your stimulus check? Uh, 1200 The same 12. as everyone else. Yeah. 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 So you, bought, you started a company with that. Yeah, well, you know, it's, it's kind of like inside joke. I used to say it was like the immigrant version of pre-revenue institutional funding. Do you know what I mean? The <laughs> yeah. government. Like, I knew some of the buyers from my almond milk days from grocery, so I just bought some uh, materials on Amazon. I did the labels myself. I used to be an art student a long time ago, and I sold it into um, our first store, which was Whole Foods in New York City. Okay. Yeah. And then how did it go? What was the immediate reaction? Did you have to change anything? Oh, that was wild. So I remember selling the product in that summer of 2020, 
And then I knew the buyers before. I'm like, and I, I emailed them. I was like, hey, I used to have this almond milk thing. You know, now I have these Filipino sauces. And here's a story why I did it. And then I get a reply shortly after. I'm like, Jake, we've been waiting for years for someone to do Filipino. We'll, do take, we'll take all the SKUs. Wow. It was that crazy. So it was kind of like a reaffirmation. How many SKUs did you have? We had three. Three cooking sauces okay. at the time. And so it was kind of like a reaffirmation that this could be a thing, right? Yeah. This could be something that buyers and the retailers or even the audience or consumers are waiting for. Yeah. And then what happened when COVID hit? Did you have to pivot to e-commerce or? No, I mean, we started off as retail first, believe it or not. So we launched the first product into retail in November 2020. I mean, yeah. the economy and the stores are still reeling from COVID. Yeah. So I couldn't even do in-store demos. So they wanted me to sit there at the shelf with my mask on and like <laughs> tell people about the cooking sauce. <laughs> um, so we had to be That's creative, funny. finding. I mean, we did social media. I know we did some grassroots stuff to do it, but yeah, yeah in a way, it, it kind of worked in our favor as well because people are cooking more at home, totally. so they are more interested in global flavors. And then we happened to be the only Filipino game um, in most grocery stores at that time. And at this point, are you just funding it yourself still? So from your stimulus check and then sales coming in? Yeah, at that point, I mean, that first year, it was just like a few stores. So it wasn't that much funding you needed just to get it off. I mean, I remember making the first batch of sauces in a fire kitchen, like a firehouse kitchen. It was sure. a commercial kitchen. Yeah, yeah. Just pulling in a few guys, just helped me make like, you know, 600 jars of sauce yeah. in boiling pots. You know what I mean? Uh, but shortly <laughs> after, it's like, you know, we, we needed more funding to grow. And then luckily, I was accepted into a tech accelerator, believe it or not. Which one? Uh, it's called Sputnik ATX. They're based okay. in Austin. So okay. they only done two food investments, mine included. Wow. Um, but that was really what kind of helped us do this snowball effect of fundraising. Because they believed in, you know, they knew nothing about food, but they believed in my vision. They believed in me. You know? Yeah. Well, tell me about the name before we get into the Shark Tank story. Tell me about the name. What oh, is, yeah. What does Phil and Manila mean? So Phil and Manila is kind of like uh, a combination of two words. So Phil M is the short form of Filipino American. I'm a Filipino. So okay. I was born in the Philippines, raised in New Jersey. Yeah. And um, Manila is obviously like the geographic heart of the Philippines. Okay. So the thinking was to create a name that kind of speaks to an obvious note what we do. Like yeah. Manila, Philippines, and, you know, it's a cute play on words. I like it. What made you decide to apply to Shark Tank? Or was that always in your head? What was the what was the goal there? Oh, I've I've been a huge fan of Shark Tank like since forever. Even when I was working in corporate, I used to watch like back in season three. And I just something about the show, like just watching these entrepreneurs pour their heart out on yeah. the stage. Yeah. And even listening to the sharks with their questions. It's just so different than the questions you hear back in corporate. Yeah. And so it definitely it wasn't the reason why I made the jump from corporate to entrepreneurship, but by all means it inspired me and gave me the kind of the excitement to do so. But it's always been a dream to apply. This is my third time applying. And so, you know, once I got it to the third round where, I mean, this third time where I had enough traction, it was like super exciting, obviously. Yeah. And then did you know Daniel was going to be in the room prior? They give you about, geez, less than a week notice. Okay. So, I mean, they always give you caveat every time you make it to the next stage. It's like, hey, Jake, we're going to, you know, fly you out to LA. But just like, you know, we might not fly you out. <laughs> so yeah. it's always these warnings. Yeah, and it's, it's like, a healthy hey, Jake, relationship. These are your guests. These are your guests uh, you know, this is your panel for the show. And, you know, it's Daniel Lubetsky. It's like, oh, my God, he's from the food world. That's, yeah. that's the guy. And then before you got, you went on, did you did you ramp up inventory? What, what did you do? Anything on the business side that you were trying to just adjust and get ready for a potential, obviously, big day sale? No, because we filmed back in June of last year, June of 2023. So I know the show, obviously I did the research, I watched your old, you know, your previous episodes and other episodes as well. So I know that there's a kind of a long lead time yeah. to build from when you air to when maybe you eventually, or when you film to when you eventually air. So, I mean, I'll just get this, get that step over with. And then if it happens, I'll prepare for that. Okay. So you get a spot on the show yeah. and then prior to this, are you like, okay, here's who I want to get. Here's the investor I want. Is there someone you're targeting or are you sort of going, I just want to get a deal done here? Oh my gosh. So, I mean, just to give you like a mindset. So that same weekend before I was supposed to fly out to California, I lost like this huge pitch competition. So I was like down in the weeds. I was super depressed. When you say you lost, like you, you were in the final and I you was lost? in the top three. And then okay. like, the, it was a big prize. It was like $250,000 investment. Wow. And the winner was determined by vote. And I've never won a popular contest, like popularity contest in my life. Okay. And so I was like, I was super depressed. And then I flew out to California, you know, that following Monday morning. And then, you know, you're, you're kind of you're always in the weeds and you're thinking about this stuff as an entrepreneur. Yeah. And I'm sitting in a hotel room in California. I'm like, I'm like, holy poop. You're like, I'm about to go on Shark Tank. Yeah. And so it just puts you in a different frame of mind and you don't realize things are happening. But to answer your question, yeah, obviously, like I wanted to target Daniel because he comes from the food world, probably arguably one of the most successful food entrepreneurs in our industry. 
But yeah, you know, of course, like a deal is a deal and all of them are pretty amazing at what they do. Why do you think you lost the pitch competition? Just curious. Uh, so the winner was determined by vote. Um, and so, you know, it, we had to play, you know, play by the rules. So I'm not going to call like a Philippine call center. Or something. <laughs> so, <laughs> that would have been a good idea, by know, the way. You, you, now you, that you I know, I would have called Manila, Philippine call say, hey, uh, yeah. But uh, maybe I guess our, our network wasn't as strong as some of the other entrepreneurs there. So okay. yeah, lesson learned, but it was a great experience. Which, yeah, which is I believe the right answer. It. All right. So you get on the show and, and you start your pitch and you're hoping for Daniel, obviously. Yeah. For people who don't know, former founder of Kind. And now he runs a fund called Camino Partners. We were there at his epic event last night. That I was, know. It was, was crazy bumping into you. That was the place to be. Like all the high rollers there. Like, oh my God, Diego's here. <laughs> it really was the best. <laughs> Everyone that was in there was like, this is the best party That's all great. week long. It's a good party. Yeah, yeah. And we had a lot of past guests there, which was awesome. Okay. So you're on the show. You're doing your pitch. I think you start at, you wanted 250000 for 5% of your company. I think that's what you came in with. Yeah. They shot that down pretty quickly. Yeah. But they all love the product. Give me, give me what you thought. Obviously, you know the product. It's another thing when people are on national television and it's sort of like your baby is being tasted, not live, but in real format that might be <laughs> yeah. shown to the world. And if they don't like it, ah, maybe not a good day. And so yeah. give, me a, give me a window into like what you felt after they tried the product. Oh, I mean, so, you know, being a food entrepreneur, I mean, I watched the show. Yeah. So the reaction is so critical. <laughs> yeah. um, so there's a lot of emotions going on when you're on that stage, right? I believe, and, I'd be and, sweating, like, I think. And so when they're trying the food, like, oh my God, please like it, please like it. Because I was so like in the details of how it's prepared and how it's presented to them. Right. And so once they do like it, it's almost like one barrier is lifted. Like, oh, thank God they like it. Now we have to go to the next barrier about the whole numbers thing and everything else. Yeah. yeah. But just like you know, Diego, so when I was there, that was the first day of filming. And I was pitch number three, and they kind of gave us a warning, like, hey, it's the first day of filming for the season, like the sharks are kind of feisty and like all this economic stuff going on, so be prepared. And wow. so even when I went pitch, I gave my evaluation, they're like, oh no, I was like, what? It kind of threw me off. Yeah, immediately <laughs> they were like, this is crazy. I was like, uh, okay. <laughs> So do I just keep on going? Or what? I actually so, love yeah. that when they do that, though. Like my, my, my part of it is like as an investor, I love it because it makes the entrepreneur, I don't know. I just love the positioning of it when you say like, that's fucking bullshit. Like, come on, <laughs> what are you doing here? It's a, it's a great, I and mean, then it forces you also to prove it, right? Because yeah. if you have the numbers, it's, a, it's really just a numbers thing. And so the numbers can dictate that that, that that might be the correct percentage or not. Oh, for sure. And you have to respect who they are as well. I mean, they're all successful entrepreneurs in their own right. So you're not talking to VCs. You're talking to folks who built these huge businesses. Yeah. So the way they look at investments and valuation is very different than what, you know, maybe the market looks at investments and valuation as well. You know? Totally. Tell people who haven't seen your clip, yeah. sort of your gimmick, the thing that you what? did, the magical <laughs> well, moment. Gimmick. Yeah. So my shtick is that, uh, so I'm, I'm a fan of the show, so I know all the nuances, I know all the sharks. And one of the things that the sharks are known for, especially uh, Lori Grenier, is that every season she has what she calls a golden ticket. And basically, she loves the product, she loves the entrepreneur so much, she gives the value, uh, uh, an offer at face value, whatever the entrepreneur asks for. Yeah, it's like a golden ticket, a literal golden ticket. So I had the idea, I told the producers, like, hey, what if I had a golden ticket idea? So if things aren't going well for me, I'll pull it out of my back pocket. It's a golden ticket. It's a paper that says royalty on it. And then I'll say, sharks, every season, I'd like to give my favorite shark a golden ticket. And, um, <laughs> and the idea was to incite a royalty offer, right? To take away the risk and then hopefully get some excitement and maybe some new offers from the shark. And so that's what I did kind of like towards the end when the sharks started to drop out. Yeah. And so they're dropping out, but Daniel's in, and then you bring out the golden ticket <laughs> and it says royalty. And Mr. Wonderful goes, this is it. I'm back in. And now he's trying to give you a deal. Yeah. He goes, royalty, you say. And then like, like I said, you know, is it truly a shark tank experience unless you get a royalty deal from Mr. Wonderful? Yeah. So it was kind of funny and exciting that he came in, but... You know, when I'm on the stage, I was nervous as, as hell. You know, I it's believe like, what it. the heck is going on? Yeah. And then when uh, when you could see Daniel's reaction to that, he's like, what? And I was like, oh, shit. I'm like, I'm about to lose Daniel Lebetsky. Like, I got to focus all my attention towards him. Yeah. So even after Mr. Wonderful was nice enough to give me an offer, like, I didn't even look at <laughs> Kevin. <laughs> That's right. All my attention was trying to close a deal with Daniel at the time. And you closed it at $250,000 for 20%, right? Is that right? Well, on the show is for 20%, but drops to 15 if certain uh, milestones are hit. So, I mean, it, in a way, it was a, it was a sharky offer, but you come to expect it. And also, given who he is, and you know, it, 
there are some pros and cons to it. And here's what I love about this story. So obviously successful, you're currently in due diligence. And then yeah. yesterday we meet at Expo West at Daniel's party, <laughs> the Camino Partners Happy Hour, and all his portfolio companies are there. And you're like, his analyst is here. I got to go close the analyst. <laughs> well, I was there to get the check from Daniel. Like, hey, did you, did you spot me hundred bucks for now? That's pretty amazing. And so give people a window into, into in some way in real time where it's yeah. like it's happening. This was yesterday. And so- yeah. What's the due diligence like? You're dealing with the analysts. Give people a window that you know are hopeful to be on the show, hopeful to get a deal closed, and then any insight you have on what the process is like. Usually, you know, I'll hear with Mr. Wonderful specifically. I guess his team is is super amazing. Same thing yeah. with Mark's teams. Actually, all the all the teams that they deal with are amazing. Yeah. And then what I've heard is like Mark and Kevin are both huge promoters also of the products. Like they sort of, yeah. they'll talk to you directly. You're not always dealing with the team. You deal with the team a little bit on the finance side, the due diligence side, the analyst. Right. But what has it been like, you know, for, for working with Daniel? Oh, incredible. I mean, Daniel is amazing. I mean, he's, he's very wealthy. He doesn't need the money. So he does this a lot for, to give back to the entrepreneur community and to help entrepreneurs build great food brands. So even after the pitch, like the first step was meeting with members of his team and they, they congratulated me and just kind of highlighted what happens next. Very clear. So during the whole process from then up until now, like very fast response times, they're very fair because they're from the industry. Sure. Uh, so they kind of know what to look for, what to expect and kind of like the communication, like, yeah. you know, terms. Yeah. And so, um, and then what I will say too is that they're so fair too because like they're very open to renegotiation. Yeah. So they want to make sure that the deal is happy for both. They know it's what happens on a TV show can get crazy because a lot of emotions are flying. Things might be different under the lights versus what's happening in real life. Um, so, you know, we're working with them towards, obviously, the goal of getting, of closing the deal. Yeah. The terms are still a negotiation. Yeah. That's awesome. I, it's so funny. So the analyst, I, I don't know his name, but people were talking to him the entire night. Yeah. I think every night they're all yeah, like, he's the guy out. I got to convince. Yeah. It's really interesting. Well, congrats on that. That's a pretty amazing. And I love how the story was unfolding in real time. Tell people what's next for the brand. Where do you want to take it? Where are you rolling out? Yeah. So, I mean, like what I mentioned in the show, we did a whole product transition like last year we used to be in glass now we're in things like pouches and squeezy bottles and the whole purpose of that was to unlock e-commerce because we've been a retail first company when we first started yeah. uh, so shark tank obviously was a huge blessing and kind of gave us a head start in the world of e-commerce i think i mentioned to you that in the first 48 hours of airing we did more online sales than we did in 2023 um, all together that's crazy yeah so we have this we're lucky enough to get this huge collection of emails consumer data yeah. obviously the sales bump and so moving forward in 2024, we're going to see how much we can grow our digital our digital sales channel. Okay, via um, e-commerce. That's going to be your main play. E-commerce is going to be big, yeah. And obviously, we still have our retail channels as well. We're in Target, Whole Foods, yeah. Meyer, Stop and Shop. Yeah. That's a smart play. Does yeah. that change your percentage when you're doing the DD with them, going with an e-commerce play versus a purely CPG retail play? Of course. I think e-commerce in itself definitely helps with the bottom line. It's more profitable, right? 100%. And also, you know, that helps with, especially in this climate with raising money. I mean, if you prove you're not only growing from a top, but also bottom line as well, that's Absolutely. always helpful. Yeah. yeah. When it comes to raising capital, are you still raising capital? Yeah. So we, we are in the middle of a bridge around. Our most recent investor was Whole Foods. Uh, so they believe in the vision. They believe in the assortment. And so we're continuing to close that bridge round. We have a couple angels, and we are building a, a WeFunder campaign as well. That's amazing. All right, when does it go live? When does the WeFunder go live? And what's the minimum so people can hopefully support you in some way? I think the minimum, we want to keep it, you know, because we had so much grassroots excitement about it. It's a very cultural product. Do you know what I mean? Like everyone, not only in the U.S., but Canada, but overseas, they want to see the growth of the culture and cuisine through our products. So the minimum will be as low as like 50 bucks. You know, you just be part of the movement. We're looking to launch the WeFunder at least kind of like a preview page in about three weeks or so. Okay, so April. Yeah. People can look out for it in April. Dream Collab. Is it Joe Coy? Who is it? Who's the Dream Collab? Dream Collab. You know, there are, there are a lot of like insanely successful Filipino Americans. Joe Coy, you know, Bruno Mars, you know, um, you know, Bretman Rock. Oh, Bruno Mars would be perfect. There would be a lot. Um, so I don't know. It's like, but to be honest with you, it's like, you know, our cuisine is so amazing. We don't have to limit ourselves to just Filipino collaborations. Because actually, eight of our 10 customers who buy our stuff are not Filipino. So, I mean, like, if you look at Dream Collabs, like, anyone who's involved in the world of food, like, just be, who be excited about Filipino flavors, like, that would be a Dream Collab. For people listening that maybe haven't had the product, how do you tell them to try it? What's the food that they pair it with? Just give them a window so it's like, if they're a little apprehensive at the store, they don't know what to do, 
What what are the things that you pair it with? Yeah, I mean, well, you have three product lines. So we have cooking sauces, we have our banana ketchup as a condiment, and then we have our ube. It's a purple yam, right? It's, it's like one of the hottest things on TikTok right now. It's a spread. So for example, with our ube spread, it comes in a pouch. You just use it the same way you use a peanut butter. So put it on toast. You could put it on ice cream. You know, eat it right straight from the pouch. You could put it on ice cream? Oh, it's delicious on ice cream. It's amazing. A banana ketchup is just like regular ketchup, but made with bananas. There's no tomatoes, but the macros are insane. It's like half the calories, carbs, and sugar of regular tomato ketchup. It was actually the number two selling ketchup on Amazon. Really? Uh, the only ketchup that Elt sold us was Heinz tomato ketchup. Do people eat it with fries? Oh, yeah. I mean, like, you can so eat it like with a fried chicken, with fries. It's delicious. Yeah. I haven't tried your products, so I'm excited to try them. I, I brought some, like, we got some stuff sitting in front of us, by the way. We got some ube and banana ketchup. Like, That's amazing. What a weird <laughs> statement. Yeah. <laughs> what, what else can you tell us? What else can you tease up for this year? What's the biggest thing on your agenda for 2024? We have these great core flavors of ube, banana ketchup, and adobo. So we're looking for 2024 to build that up through e-commerce and our retail. Starting next year, you're going to see a lot more innovation, like driving around those core flavors. So like ube is like the hottest thing right now, right? So what can we do aside from a spread? Maybe frozen novelties could be some cookies and stuff. Uh, so we're doing some innovation testing right now to see what's, what else is out there. But Filipino cuisine is growing. We're just excited to be part of that. I think for if it, the cool thing about being on Shark Tank is that we're exposing Filipino cuisine to thousands, if not if millions of people for the first time. Yeah. yeah, and we're doing it in an authentic way. I mean, I'm like super Filipino, so... It's, it's very authentic. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you doing that. I mean, as, as an immigrant, I know what it's like to sort of expose your culture to the world. Yeah. And there's a lot of pride in that. Yeah. And so thank you for doing that. Thank you for sharing your story. Yeah. Where can people find you? Where can they support? Yeah, I mean, if you're, um, if you're online, obviously at philomeno.com, you can find us on Amazon. But, you know, we're also available in several retail stores across the U.S., select so Targets, Whole Foods, Stop and Shops, Myers, and uh, check out our store locator on philomeno.com. And if you're interested in investing, we'll drop the WeFunder link. Yeah, please. And, uh, yeah, please join do. the party. Please Jake, do. thank you, brother. Thanks for coming on. No, thanks for having me. It was great. Thank you for tuning in. If you enjoyed this episode, share with your friends, your family, or anyone you might think might benefit from the conversation we've had today. And if you haven't already, please take a moment to leave a review on your favorite podcast platform. We'd greatly appreciate it. Your feedback helps us improve and reach more people who can benefit from our discussions. The best way to stay connected with us and get the latest updates on future episodes is through our social media channels. You can find us at Startup Storefront. We'll be back next Tuesday with another great episode. See you then.